We are now going to discuss, discuss sections 3.1 and 3.2, elements and symbols on the periodic table. Elements are pure substances that cannot be separated into simpler substances by ordinary laboratory processes. Do not confuse this with atoms, which is on page 96. Think of elements as if you had a whole bunch of Legos and you put all the green Legos together, that would be an element. And all the red Legos together, that would be another element. All the yellow Legos together, that would be another element. Whereas the atoms are all the individual Legos that make up. So one green, one green Lego is only an atom of all the green Legos, which are the elements. And I use that metaphor because they're the building blocks. So when you stack things together and you build something, you're building something new with Legos. If you take it apart, it's still the atoms, it's still the elements, but you're going to rearrange them to make something else. And these are located on the periodic table of elements. They're also on a list on the front cover of your book, but I would strongly recommend getting very familiar with the periodic table because you're going to be using it time and time again this semester. So where do these elements get their names from? Some of them are named from planets like uranium, like Uranus. Some of them are mythical f figures, the Titans, minerals, colors, geographic location, for instance, Californium, famous people, Madame Curie, Curium, things along those lines. So it's whoever discovers the element has the opportunity to name it. Chemical symbols. This is a big reason why I wanted to reinforce this concept, even though it's review. A lot of people get thrown off by when another element begins. A capital letter means it's a new element. If you see a lowercase element or a lowercase letter, that means those two letters go together, and that's what you should be looking for on the periodic table. If you have, for instance, big C, big O, you have two different elements here because you have two different capital letters. Unlike big C, little o, because this one's little, you have one element here. That's the what you want to look for when you're looking at chemical symbols and chemical compounds. Some of the symbols don't really seem very obvious to us at first, but that's because they are representing an ancient name. For instance, silver used to be called Argentum, which is why we have AG for silver, even though it starts with an S. Or gold, Aurorum, is AU. So even though it doesn't match up the English term, it matches up to some other term. So let's take a minute to examine the periodic table. Keep in mind, I've been looking at the periodic table for an extremely long time, for 15, 20 years. Whereas you might be just now starting to look at it. So I'm going to find these a lot faster than you, but you really need to focus on not necessarily memorizing the periodic table, but just getting more familiar with it so you don't waste all your time doing mundane things. So if we look for iodine. Iodine is right here. Its chemical symbol is I. Iron, that's a hard one. It's right here. Its chemical is Fe. That's one of those that are kind of odd. Magnesium is right here. Its chemical symbol is Mg. Zinc is right here. Its chemical symbol is Zn. And nitrogen is right here. And its chemical symbol is N. Once again, I found those really fast because I'm familiar with the periodic table. And that's what you need to start doing. So let's reverse this and see if we can figure out what the names are if we're given the symbols. So P is right here. And that's phosphorus. AL is right here. And it's aluminum. MN is here manganese. H is the very first one and it's hydrogen. And K is another one that's kind of odd. It's here and it's actually potassium. 
All right, so let's go on to the periodic table since we've been talking about it so much. Periodic table is a very systematic way of organizing the elements. So that way we can kind of predict what's going to happen by just looking at the periodic table. They're arranged with similar properties, so chemical and physical. We have groups, which are vertical, which means that they're up and down. And we have periods, which are horizontal, which are left to right. Here's the periodic table. So this one would be a group because it's vertical, and this one would be a period because it's horizontal. There are seven periods on the periodic table. Notice the first one begins at hydrogen and helium. There's only two elements in that one. Now look at the vertical groups. Those are a little bit more confusing because there's a couple different ways of naming them. One way is just a number left to right, 1 to 18. Another way is to do 1A, 2A, and then we're going to skip over to 3A. So the tall rows are A's and the short rows are B's. That's because of how they react. They're grouped differently. The ones that are short are called transition metals, whereas the ones that are tall are called representative metals or representative elements. So... A is representative element, whereas the B, which are the short ones, are transition elements. So let's take a look at some of the names. These, it's just, this is basically memorization. One is alkali metals, two are alkaline earth. The noble gases are actually really, really important. The reason for that is because all of the elements try to react to look to try to be like the noble gases. The noble gases are extremely stable. They don't react. They're also called inert gases. And that's why they're called inert because they don't react as as much. Some of the heavier ones down here do, but not nearly as much as any of the other ones on the periodic table. So these other elements are going to gain and lose electrons to be like the noble gases, to have the same amount of, ele same amount of electrons. For instance, if we look at group 1A, those are the alkali metals. These are the ones right here. You notice you have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. Those are extremely reactive. And the reason why, if you take a closer look, let's take a look at sodium, for instance. Sodium has, is number 11. That means when it's stable, it has 11 electrons when it's, uh, when it's in its elemental form. If you look on the noble gases, if you were to try to find the one that would be most closely related, you have a choice of 10 or 18. Neon is 10. So it goes from 11 to 10. It only has to lose one electron in order to be like a noble gas. Because of that, it makes it very reactive because it wants to get rid of that electron as quickly as it can possibly can do it. The halogens are kind of in the same scenario. They're the ones right here. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so on. Chlorine is right here with 17 the atomic number 17, which means when it's neutral, when it's an atom in its elemental form, it has 17 electrons. Argon, however, has 18, so it only needs to gain one more electron to be like a noble gas. Because they're, because both of these groups are only one away, they tend to be more reactive. So let's take a second to identify the element that is being described. So we have group 7A. Now remember, group means that it is the vertical rows, whereas periods are horizontal. So 7A, A means it's the tall group, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
and then it's in the fourth period, which means it's in the fourth row down. Remember, you start counting at hydrogen and helium. So one, two, three, four. That would be bromine. Brilliant. Okay, so group 2A. So one, two, this is the group 2A. Period three, that's the third row down. One, two, three. We're looking at magnesium with this one. Group 5A, one, two, three, four, five. Period two. One, two. So we're going across two. Here we go. Nitrogen. Kind of like reading a map. Alright, so let's take a look, bit of a closer look at the periodic table as far as the types of elements. There are three types of elements. There's metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metalloids are also sometimes called semi-metals. So if we look at their location, every, here's a squiggly line here. That's going to be our dividing point. Everything to the left of that are going to be metals. To the right of that, we have nonmetals. On the squiggly line is our halfway point. Those are both metals and nonmetals, called metalloids. They have characteristics of both types. So it's kind of like a halfway point. So if we looked at the characteristics, the properties, metals are shiny and ductile. Ductile means that it can be pulled into a wire. Basically means you can shape them. Good conductors, they can conduct heat and electricity. Nonmetals are the exact opposites. Instead of being shiny, they're now dull. Instead of being able to be shaped and pulled into a wire, they're brittle. Instead of being conductors, they are not conductors, they're insulators. Metalloids are halfway. They kind of have characteristics of both. They're better conductors than nonmetals, but not as good as metals. And some are semi some are used as semiconductors and some are used as insulators. It all depends. So it's kind of has a mixture of both. So here's some side by side comparisons. Silver's a metal. Anemone's a metalloid. Sulfur's a nonmetal. So silver's shiny. And sulfur is dull, whereas blue-gray, kind of shiny, is an anemone. So it's kind of like the halfway point. Extremely ductile. We can mold it very easily. Extremely brittle. It's going to break. In this character, in this situation, the, the metalloid is brittle. So you can see, if we look at side by side, so, uh, metals are one extreme, non-metals are the other extreme. Metalloids are in the middle. So let's try to match up some of these. Sodium is right here. It's in the blue area. It's on the left of the metalloids, so this is going to be a metal. Chlorine is right here. It's to the right of that squiggly line, which means it's going to be a nonmetal. Silicone is right on the squiggly line. That means it's going to be a semi-metal or the metalloid. Iron is right here. It's to the left of the squiggly line, which makes it a metal. And carbon is here. It's to the right of the squiggly line, which makes it a nonmetal. And that is the end of sections 3.1 and 3.2.